Hello, my name is David Quick and I'm the Adult Services Coordinator at the DC Public Library. I'm happy to welcome you to this special conversation with Harvey Firestein for his recent memoir, I Was Better Last Night. Harvey Firestein is an icon of American theater and film and a beloved member of the LGBTQ community. We are so glad to host this conversation and hear from him about the book and his life and career. A special thanks to Jack Harrison Quintana, director of Grinder for Equality, for leading the conversation with Harvey. Enjoy the conversation, everyone. Harvey, thank you so much for being here with us today. How are you? I'm, I'm great. I'm, I'm sitting in the, in, the, in my small fictional town in Connecticut. <laughs> here, it's a, it's a lovely evening, and uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. Your well, I'm ready to ask them. I really enjoyed the memoir. Uh, you know, I really wanted to start where the book starts, which is your childhood. And I'm curious what it felt like to revisit the memories from the earliest part of the book. Well, uh, what happened was my agent, um, we had just gone into lockdown for, for, for the, the disease of the, of, the, of the month. And um, my agent said to me, um, why don't you write a memoir? And mm. I said, I don't write that kind of stuff. I, I barely write sentences, you know, that's why I went into theater. Lyrics. So actually write sentences and mm. um and I, I said i you know i write op-eds and stuff like that but they're not very long and, and and then i thought you know it's the same thing as the advice i give in the book which is if you don't do it you never know if you can and it's mm. saying no doesn't change anything saying yes is the only way to get anything done or to find out anything and you know um I was watching a Big Bang Theory last night as I was showering off the dust of my wonderlust, and um, and the, and and Sheldon was talking about Schrodinger's cat. Mm. But it's the same sort of thing. You unless you take it on, you don't know. And so I said, well, you know, I'm stuck at home anyway, and you know, I was making masks um, as as many of us were. Uh -huh. with, sewing, with sewing machines I was making mess and I said I was kind of bored of that already and um and so I sat down at the computer and I thought um let me write a childhood memory mm. and I wrote the story about that Halloween uh, not the Halloween about the uh, Sleeping Beauty show um uh -huh. in second grade your so desire wrote, to be in drag I desired to, to play the Wicked Witch and not the King Mm -hmm. and, and um and so i wrote that and i looked at it and i said it's kind of cute and i sent it to my friend philomena who actually played the wicked witch in in first grade and um i said if she likes it then maybe i'll show it to my agent and so i sent it to her not only did she like it but she sent me back the photograph that's oh, mm -hmm. of, of me in drag at at seven years old and um i said okay it meant something to her. So that's two people it meant something to. Maybe I got something here. So so um so that sort of gave me the courage to sit down and I just I wrote um I, I as I say in the book, I'm dyslexic. And so mm. I read in chunks and and I, I decided that's how I, I would write it. I wanted it to I wanted it to feel like a visit with me. I, I read a lot of memoirs mm. and so often I, uh, I get three chapters in and throw the book away because they don't sound like the person, you know, mm. the people I know, uh, I say, oh, you had a ghost writer. What's wrong with you? Um, Alan Menken just called me um, and said that Disney won. You know who Alan Menken is? He wrote. Of course. Wrote but, tell, but tell everyone. Well, he's the composer of A Little Shop of Horrors, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid. I mean, he's one of the greatest composers of, of our time. And, and, he, he, and he lives over there. And he um, called me and he said, Disney wants me to write my memoir. Mm. Before the words could get out, I said, it has to be in your voice. And if mm. you tell it to me or anyone else, it's not going to be your voice. And uh, I want to hear from you. That's what a memoir is about. Otherwise, it's a biography. And um, and so I told him, go get a tape recorder and a drink. He still drinks. I 
been sober 27 years, but some people can handle it. I said, go get a tape recorder and a drink and sit down every night with that drink and tell a story to the tape recorder. Mm. Just, one, just one story. Nobody else ever has to hear it. Just tell the truth. And someday we'll look at it or whatever. And maybe there's something there. Maybe there isn't. And I and I that's sort of how I went about it. I got up every morning, mm. sat down, and I wrote the next, the next thing that came to me of, of my life, and and tried really hard to not be mean, um, and to uh, and to tell the truth. Yeah. Did you dredge up anything from childhood that was forgotten, or was it all kind of at your fingertips? That's hard to that's hard to know um, uh, how to answer because because I I went through that three years ago. But I will tell you this, which is the strangest part. Um, since I wrote the book, I have not wanted to write. Huh? And what I, do you make of that? What, I, mean, I think I I think I dumped so much of myself into that. You know, it's uh-huh. I don't I don't know if you if you're familiar with the artist's way. Uh huh. They, they, they talk about. Um, refilling the well that sometimes you you do a project that's so depleting and you need to allow the well to to fill up again and i think the well first of all, i wrote the book then then of course I, I did a year and a half of endless interviews and stuff um talking about the book so by the time that, that was all done there really wasn't i didn't i, the, the, I was pretty depleted of 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 whatever I was thinking. And I, um, the Times came to me, the New York Times came to me and sort of offered me a, a gig as an op-ed writer. I've written op-eds for them before, but uh-huh. um, I sat down and I wrote one. But, uh-huh. I, but it, to me, it was like, you're not saying anything new, you're not saying. And so I decided to take out my sewing machine instead and mm. make quilts for a, a while. And that's what hmm. I did. I, I am starting to feel like writing again, though. You're this getting there now. This, yeah, this interview may kill it, but... Um, <laughs> well, but hopefully I, not. But I have... No, you, you start feeling it sort of roiling up inside you that you have something to say that you've yeah. that you not yet said. And um, and so we'll, we'll see. But at the, at the moment of, of the last year, I haven't really had a need to write. Well, you know what you know, struck me the most probably about your childhood stories as you know, a gay man myself is just how much access I you have. I never guessed. Go on. Yeah, it was an obvious when I opened my mouth. I mean, you know, you had so much access to LGBTQ community and spaces so early in a way that, you know, as a reader coming from my childhood in Tennessee, I thought, I, there was no way for me to access this, right? Compared to someone living in some city, which was really a huge thing. Yeah, that's and that definitely true. Yeah, Tennessee, probably. Well, except you're you're pretty young. How old are you? Well, I'm 37. There yeah, was the world was already the world was already changing by the time you. Well, were. I had the internet, right? But you were able to go to you know Christopher Street and all of the literal physical gay spaces so early and i guess i was curious if you felt like that helped your trajectory toward all of the more you know in your face lgbtq stuff you ended up doing as an adult um well i'll tell you um yes i was born in the i was born in brooklyn uh and, and from brooklyn for for a high I and I skipped two years. So and I started high school in the eighth grade, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth in the high school of art and design, which was I teasingly say it was an all-gay school. They bust uh-huh. heterosexuals in, but um, but it was very gay. And I was right. two years younger than everybody else. Mm. So um, so everyone was already leading me along I mean you know teaching me to smoke teaching me to drink teaching me to roll joints it was you know uh, an education right off the bat um ding yourself and um so there was that then art and design was in Manhattan Mm. that took me my brother 
the smart one, he went to Stuyvesant oh, yeah. High School, which was uh, for, you know, for science-y kind of kids. So yeah. he went to Manhattan also. So the two of us were already escaping Brooklyn. By um, the way, I love the story of the kids who had never been to Manhattan, had never left your borough until the school well, trip, right? I mean, I unfortunately, I still know people like that. Do I you? I'm, I'm I amazed that people can exist like that now. I know people that live in this town that have barely been to other towns around us. Um, the world is as small as your imagination. Sure. And uh, comfort and what is comfortable for you. Why do you think this all this screaming of make America great again? They want they want to think that that it's comfortable back in their memories they forget mm. all the bad stuff we of course only remember the good stuff and they think somehow there was something magical back there it wasn't magical <laughs> I have memory of it all anyway so i started so you're going into manhattan i started into manhattan and all that and then as i said my friends were older my friend michael especially um, took me to the village and all that i, I just watched on I think it was on HBO, a documentary called The Stroll, which uh -huh. was transgender women of color um, who worked as prostitutes on 14th Street. Well, I hung out there. I hung out with them. I knew half the people in the documentary. Um, of course, they were, well, they weren't that much older than me. They felt older than me. They were probably mm. 17, 18, and I was 15. Um, they could go into the bars like Marsha. Johnson could go into the bar. That's how the uh, Stonewall started, but I couldn't go into the bar. I wasn't old enough. I was out on the stoop. So um, so so yes, yeah, so I was there and I was and I was dipped into that world. But uh, there was something that I don't I, I probably has to do with how I was brought up. It probably has to do with a lot of stuff that it always seemed to me it was not worth lying. Mm. I mean, not that I always told the truth, <laughs> but it seemed to me that who you were was not something. And like I said, because I was so, so surrounded by gay people, I was more curious looking at the heterosexuals. I found them kind of bizarre. And, uh -huh. Anthropologically interesting. Well, no, they're, they're uninteresting. Okay. <laughs> they, were doing, they were doing what they were doing. Look, any gay kid, has been through psychoanalysis, self-psychoanalysis, just coming out. You're yeah. a kid, you're in the world, you're looking at your family, you're looking at people around you. And for the most part, they're heterosexual and they have this sort of model, boys act like boys, girls act like girls. And you're sitting there going, this isn't the way I feel. Right, What's right. What's on here? And so you figure out who you are, and then you hold it out into the world and go, this can't be the right answer. So you mm -hmm. go back and you do another analysis. And all kids, all gay kids go through that. So by the time they are ready to come out, they've already asked all these questions that no heterosexual would ever ask. Why do you think straight people are so freaked out over this new gender war? They're mm -hmm. freaked out because it never occurred to them to ask mm -hmm. how they felt. This is how, this is what they told me to be. This is what I am. These are the clothes they put on me. And that's that. And it's that lack of curiosity that sort of bores me about heterosexuals. Though I have opened my mind more. I know many <laughs> and, and I like um, some of them. So, um, so uh, that, that was my world and that's who I was. I, the, 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 I then went into theater, community, community theater, not, yeah. not real theater. I never, there was no part of it that wanted to be in theater. I didn't want to be an actor. I didn't want to be a writer. I, it was not, I want to be an artist. If I had my dream, it was to be a, a, an animator for Disney. So, but I wasn't good enough for that, and I, I, I really wasn't good enough artist for any of that stuff. What I could have been, and what I sort of hoped to be, was, um, uh, you know, a technician, somebody who could work in somebody else's studio, and right? Great work for for a great artist. That's what I thought I would do. I was scared that I'd end up a New York City school teacher, which I almost did. You almost did, right? I almost right. did. And that was scary enough, but but um, 
but uh, life had a different plan and, and this idea of saying yes to things came along and I just followed this path and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but eventually this a whole other life appeared for me. Yeah, I mean, for me, especially I think of my second read of the book, it just feels like there's such a clear through line from your childhood, that school where there were so many other queer kids to the art that you ultimately produced in the form of porch song and, you know, uh, you know, then playing famous roles in drag. But I guess that's not, I guess you set out to do that originally. No, 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 I didn't. I mean, it was sort of fun. Those are fun things to do. And, and um, you know, joining the avant-garde theater movement right. was because they were artists, not necessarily theater artists they were performing artists i mean i did a i did a thing where um where i was where i was um um uh, madame chiang kai shek um uh, in a city that they wanted me to sit in a tub of human excrement uh -huh. um, middle of in the middle of this, uh, broadway in soho um i was <laughs> Sarah and all that. i mean we were doing weird wild stuff uh-huh you know, that you wouldn't necessarily call theater but um at the same time those people around me there were people uh, moving from where we were to like Tom O'Horgan he had a show called Hair which he then you know ended up on Broadway or you know the uh, Paul Foster had had uh, Elizabeth the first for one night on Broadway uh, the, uh -huh. the, there were people that looked at that stuff and 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 I was in, in, but I was there for a very different reason. So even though it wasn't ultimately what you set out to do, I mean, do you feel like, feel, oh, I don't know, you must feel proud of the impact that your art has had. And we're in such a different day, day for better and for worse, but we're certainly in a worse different day for things like the arguments you would get into about having a gay pass. Right. I mean, now having a gay kiss in a mainstream television show is not such a deal. Right. And you were certainly a part of that. But it's still, but what's funny is um, I just spoke to some people who just saw Brokeback Mountain, the musical in, uh -huh. in London. The opera or the musical? It's a musical. There's an, there's an opera, too. An opera. Uh, yeah, I, I hadn't seen the opera, but uh, but um, but uh, anyway, they're doing the musical. Uh -huh. and one of the one of the two gentlemen in it was one of the boys that was in my show Newsies, and I love him. Uh -huh. I, and um, but I laughed because I, you know, you say, "Oh, look at this opportunity!" And all you know, this gay story being told. The two guys playing the leads are both straight. Mm. It was still there, you know. We're still there. We're still the self-loathing um, because it is us that are in charge of hiring us and we don't hire us. We hate mm. ourselves. Um, the self-loathing is still so evident. Um, I, I, once again, I was watching the, the stroll and there was a scene in it where Sylvia Rivera is, is screaming at the crowd at the, at, uh, on, on uh, the gay day. Um, this this particular year, which they don't really explain in the movie, um, the, the um, what was it, the Gay Alliance GAA, uh, one of those groups, sent out flyers to everybody: do not come and drag, and wear and wear nice clothes, and don't look ridiculous, and don't put flowers near. We need to the the press will be there, and they will be covering this, and we need to look like a political movement and all that. And Sylvia got up in front of the crowd at the thing where she was being booed, and she said. Fuck you all! I've given my entire life to this movement. I've had, I've lost my job. I've lost my home. I live on the street. I've, uh, my, I had my nose broke. I've been in the, I've been in in jail more times than you can count. And you're gonna stand there and boo me when you wouldn't exist without me? And that's it was heartbreaking because I, I, I was there for the actual speech. Yeah, yeah. But to hear it again, well, like I said. I mean, I remember how angry we were. You yeah. know, we, we did not come and drive. I, I'm sure I wore little short shorts, but, but <laughs> at the body. Well, and what does it mean to not come and drag, right? Presenting your gender in any way could be a I form of drag. Yeah, but I, 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 that's just, I never was a street drag queen. 
you know, many of my friends were, but, but I never was. I did drag on stage. To me, it's too much work. Right. <laughs> yeah, so much work, you know. For sure. You have to dress like a boy, let alone a girl. Being pretty is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's right. It's, you know, it's well, true. Well, are there pieces that you created that you think have had the biggest impact, either in terms of no, artistically not, or LGBTQ? It's not my business. Not my business. <laughs> that's no. not how you think about it. No, I don't, because I do what I mean. Is it nice that people, you know, put all kinds of stuff on you? Sure, it's nice, but but I don't. Uh, you're in my office right now. I mean, you uh-huh. can't very much, but do you see a picture of me or a poster or of a show of mine or anything here? No. Yeah, no. No, it's not important to me. My past is my past, which was interesting about writing the book. Yeah, but, that is interesting then. Yeah, but I don't because, I don't live with I mean I go into people's houses where they have their, their Tony Awards in the in the living room and and all the walls have their posters of their shows and all that. I have a storeroom um uh-huh. down in, uh, behind my studio and and I do have posters up on the wall. I mean I, because because it's a storeroom. So sure. then and, and it's a nice place and I, I can see them if if I go in there and I need something out of the storeroom <laughs> but it's it's not a good thing to live with it's you know, uh, well, you could be forgiven for living with your awards but that's very interesting well, my, my well my tony awards i do live with actually they're in my bathroom okay well that's an interesting spot they're, they're present the, then they're on a high shelf they're on a high shelf in the bathroom you wouldn't really notice them there's all these uh broadway cares for years was making these um uh, what do you call those paperweight globes? You know, the snow globes with uh-huh. all the shows of that season, you know, in the snow globe. And I had a friend that every year gave me um, that snow, those snow globes every year because I always had a show that was on Broadway and, and usually said so. So I have those snow globes on these glass shelves and the Tony Awards are mixed uh-huh. in with that. But mostly it was, I don't tell anybody, but I've left awards in air. <laughs> all right i've left them i've left i've left them in the, you know under the table at the dinner party <laughs> it's well it's, i won't tell anyone but you're recorded uh yeah, but, for all of time saying so okay, you know what it's like yeah, it's it's like Mar- the ghost of marley you know mm. dragging his sins behind him mm. like you don't want your past being dragged behind you you want to be fresh every day and you well better- it is true, though, that your past must inform how you're feeling about current politics. And yeah, I do feel like, like... But not awards but not awards and stuff. Not awards, sure. No, not awards and not, not what other people have to say about you. I mean, critics, I, you know, I don't like being mean about critics. But uh, an, an example I can give that's not mean at all. When I wrote the second act of Torch Song Trilogy, Fugue uh-huh. and Emergency, that all takes place in a bed. Yes. One third of the critics said how brilliant Firestein is for placing this whole thing in the bed. Mm. One third of the critics said how brilliant Eric was for directing the play in a bed. And mm-hmm. one third uh, credited Bill Stabile, the, the designer, for putting the whole thing in a bed. Mm. Not really their job to know. Mm. Go in and experience the thing. But these stupid ass critics think they have to walk in and know more than the people who created the show. Mm-hmm. They, have, they can't just come in and enjoy it and then tell people whether they enjoyed it or not. No, they have to come in. Um, Kinky Boots. Uh-huh. Kinky, I don't think there's a single review of Kinky Boots that identifies um, Lola as a heterosexual. But she uh-huh. the whole second act opens with her singing what a woman wants, a whole thing right. about, about how she loves women and women love her. Not a single review in and the show's been running how many years now? Um, and nobody, they still they just don't even listen. They don't mm. listen. They just they have to walk in thinking they know. I wrote a play called Casa Valentina uh-huh. about, about heterosexual transvestites. I knew nothing about that life until I did the research, but I did research. I mean, I did research and I read hundreds of magazines and articles and all that. 
They walk in as if they know everything about this work. Never listen to a word. Mm. I, I mean, it's, it's remarkable to me how, how little um, thought and talent goes into being a critic. And mm. these days, that's, and I'm talking about before, these days, everything is just clickbait. It's like, how can I write something that'll get a lot of clicks? Because the more clicks I get, it'll be a guarantee that my job won't get canceled. Right. Uh, right. So, I, so you can listen to critics even less now. Well, it has been really interesting to read the book over the last few months that we are experiencing all of these anti-LGBTQ attacks, you know, particularly at the state level. And it does feel like your story is kind of all over these current um, issues. I mean, drag bans, children's books, which of course you wrote the LGBT children's book. Exactly. But let me just tell you, I was very proud of one thing in the news. I was really proud. I, oh. I, I don't remember who I don't remember who published it, but somebody published the list of the 10 most banned musicals in like community theaters uh -huh. and all that. I wrote three of them. Wow, what are the three? I was so proud. <laughs> um, I wrote three of the of the band musicals, um, Kinky Boots, uh, La Caja Fall, and Hairspray. Okay. Very, yep. very proud. I said, I uh, I, I said, uh, Santan didn't write any of those. <laughs> <laughs> I used to tease him. I, I, I wanted to work with him so badly, but I, you know, it's just not what he wanted to write. Yeah. And what has been your reaction to the, um, I mean, besides being proud that you're kind of included in the, in the, the uh, uh -huh, the ban and the what's upsetting people. I mean, how has it felt to, for there to be this backlash? Let's take drag just as one example, you know, that's been a part of your work for so long and it wasn't really the center of uh, political controversy for a while. And now we're back. What always was. It you always, think it always was. was. I mean, not in heterosexual society, in our society. Right. In gay society, there was always that, well, I don't act like them and I don't like the, those. They were always the gay internalized uh -huh. gay people who hated drag queens. Yeah. And it's it's made them look, it's made them look at all this. I understand, listen, I understand um, heterosexuals being scared of of the world changing i understand that i mm. mean like going to bed and waking up in the morning and somebody's moved all the furniture around i understand that that's scary but being scared is okay that's what nobody tells them that's nobody interesting says them, nobody says to them, you know what the world is changing look how fast it's changing we didn't i mean how long have cell phones been around, the internet, all this stuff, these huge, huge changes. And I understand. I mean, I was just um, reading an ad in the AARP magazine, uh -huh. which I get um, about a phone called, the, uh, I think it's called the Jitterbug. And 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 on the, the front page, you know, the first uh, screen that you see, it just lists all the things that you really need to do. But, you know, because senior, some senior citizens can't find the right buttons and all that. So I understand that. I totally mm -hmm. do. I mean, I, I'm just learning, as I said before, I'm, I, I'm a quilter and I just got a long arm quilting machine. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a, not. It's, it is usually you take your quilt and you you roll it up and you shove it under your little sewing machine you know you have to shove it to, to do the quilting this you put the quilt out on a frame and then you move that sewing machine oh it's fabulous but it has a computer it's all computer huh. and so learning this whole new system i'm 71 years old learning this whole new system but i go to a quilt shop where all the women are my age or older and they're oh. all learning it too and it's wonderful but these people are so frightened of anything new i mean i'm using very innocent examples here. Uh -huh, uh -huh. they're so frightened of anything new you're complaining that drag queens are reading to your children when was the last time you volunteered to go read to your children mm. you're complaining that drag queens are reading to your children we grew up with those stupid clowns. I was much more scared of clowns. Well, <laughs> pretty scared of Lady Bunny, but that's a whole other matter. Oh, you might right. be a clown as well. 
Well, they are. That's just it. You know, um, um, one of my dearest friends is is uh, Bianca Del Rio, uh -huh. the, the 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 drag clown. But um, I understand them say it, but they don't sort of like put it into perspective mm. of, of what you're looking at. Which I grew up with Shirley Temple coming through the storybook doors. She was as much a drag queen as right. Lady Bunny or any of the rest of them. I mean, it's not different. It's, right. It's different. But like I said, you don't want drag queens reading to your kids. Go volunteer yourself and, and, and tell them a story. Mm -hmm. Crazy piece of, I mean, the, the nonsense, the absolute nonsense. And it's, and they, and because of the internet, we're all in these echo chambers, which is, Coming back to that thing I talked about before of the Times asking me to write op ed, I thought, who am I writing this for? Mm. That read the Times already agree. It's like watching MSNBC. You're not telling me anything I don't know. I, I, you know, I learn more by watching Fox because it's so frightening and it's mm. so bizarre. The imagination of those people is <laughs> fascinating to me. But but you know, we, we just talk to ourselves and that's not a good thing. Well, you've certainly seen a lot of change for the LGBTQ community, you know, from going to that arts high school to the current controversies. Does it leave high school, you? High school is still there, by the way. It's is still... it? Yeah, art design is still there. I'm sure it's still very queer. Um. Sure. So I'm curious if that trajectory that you sort of trace with the book, does it leave you hopeful for where we're headed to next? Yes. The future is always hopeful until you take the wrong turn. Well, wow. no, And you can take the wrong, you know, you can take the wrong turn. I mean, I'm looking right at it. I mean, I, as a person who knows Donald Trump personally, who's oh. met, who's spoken to him, I can't believe anybody would vote for that man. <laughs> it's, it's like, you, you, say, you know, I say, uh, you, you, I'll have like a worker, you know, uh, fixing something broken in my house. And I, well, I'm never in politics. I don't know how. And then they'll say they're a Trumper. Uh -huh. do, you, do you realize that Donald Trump can't get his toilet fixed in his apartment mm. because no plumber will go up there because you give Donald Trump a bill and he pays you half and says, sue me for the rest. Mm. No unions will work for him. He's, he's the, when was the last time he built anything? He doesn't build anything. He puts his name on stuff. Mm. He's such a, a crook. Everything about him is a crook. Everything about him is a lie and a crook. If the man really had all that money, wouldn't he pay some of his own bills instead of fundraising the way he does? Mm. Do you know what? Didn't he say, I'm going to pay for my own campaign? He didn't pay nothing for nothing. Mm. I mean, the man should be going to jail for being a thief. But So I'm saying you can take a wrong turn, but usually, usually we learn from it. I, you know, I'm a little worried about Israel at the moment is the vote today. Well, we're taping this and that'll all be over by the time this. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, there are things to worry about. There certainly sure, are. For but, sure. But I think the future usually finds a way to right itself. Well, that's a good note to leave us with. I certainly feel a tremendous amount of hope seeing how far the community has come as it's depicted in your memoir. And I hope that everyone at home uh, gets a chance to read it. So it's uh, I was better was last night. But there's, but there's another interesting point before we go, which is our children now, yeah. this new, in this new environment where we have to separate sex, this new generation is separating sex uh, from gender. Right. And that's really fascinating to me. Huh. We do that. We didn't know how to do that. We uh, we fought gay, straight, whatever. Now it's gay, straight, and then there's gender and this new generation. So I really wonder about the future of gay people in this mix. Is is it going to be more interesting for us as well? Mm. I mean, I have a friend, she's a child psychologist in this small fictional town. And she said she's got tons of kids who are questioning. 
Yeah. In a small fictional town. Tons of kids questioning. Yeah. Really and I think that's happening all over the country for sure. I mean, all over whether the you're in a small town or not, everyone has the internet now. Yes, here's the book. We definitely want to plug the book. I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, obviously it's available from the library, as is your children's book, which is probably not to hand, The Sissy Duckling. Sissy Duckling. Yeah, I, um, I don't think it, it's I don't think it's in a lot of schools. I mean, I haven't heard about it being banned. Well, but. I'm sure it's also on the banned list, but we do have it in the collection here at the library. So that is available to That's folks good. as well. Good thing. And and um, oh, well, once again, this doesn't matter for you. I'm, I'm interviewing Amy Schneider in a couple of weeks mm. for the for the uh, release of her memoir. Oh, okay. You know who she is, right? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. But tell everyone at home the Jeopardy, the Jeopardy, the first transgender Jeopardy champion. Indeed. And so uh, she's putting out a, a memoir. And uh, and, and did you give her the same advice to tape herself telling stories? No, she didn't ask me for advice. Oh, okay. She's very smart. She's very smart. She does seem to be very smart. That is kind of her claim to fame. Yes, we love that. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you and, so much, uh, Harvey. And I hope your portrait ends up in the building behind you. If, <laughs> if you like I that. doubt it, but uh, you know, yours may beat me there. All right. And and, and thank you for, for caring. Oh, thank you so much for the book. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure that many of our patrons will too. I think it's fun. All <laughs> right. Thank you so much. And thank you to the library. Thank you, library. We love my mother was a librarian. We love librarians. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the conversation with Harvey Firestein. You can watch more conversations and author talks like this right here on DC Public Library's YouTube channel. You can also find Harvey's book and our events calendar on our website at dclibrary.org. Thank you.